Visa, a land ancient and rich in tradition, a land rich in contrast and variety, a world of many races, languages, and castes, a place of slow changes. To this city on the Holy River Ganges, Hindus of India bring their hopes and sorrows and offer them to the gods. Muslims of India hold other places holy and carry to them the burdens and joys of life. Answering the call to prayer, they follow the laws of the Koran, laws different from those of the Hindu creed. There are many religions and races in India, but whether sunburned Bengali or light-skinned Raja, Sikh or Muslim, they all carry India furrowed on their faces. And as varied as her children, is the face of Mother India. At the north towers the top of the world, the chain of the Himalayas with cloud-covered and wind-swept peak. And from the mountain's rocky backbone flow the rivers, the Indus River, the Ganges, and the Brahmaputra, to mention just the largest. And where there is water from rivers or wells, there is life. And where water fails, there is desert. Millions of acres of desert in the heart of the crowded subcontinent. Farther south, the highlands of India drive a wedge into the Indian Ocean, almost to the equator. And all over this vast subcontinent, cities have sprung. Large ports and many towns. More than 70 with over 100,000 inhabitants. But 80% of the people of the subcontinent are peasants who live in villages, 400 million of them, cut up into two nations, the Union of India and Pakistan, speaking dozens of languages and hundreds of dialects, divided by religion, Hindu, Muslim, Christian, Sikh, Buddhist, each praying to his own gods. Whether low caste Hindu or gypsy, whether merchant from Gujarat, or Sikh from Sin, whether Christian missionary or Muslim in Hyderabad, whether living in India or Pakistan, they are people born of the same soil, people deeply religious whose daily activities reflect an intimate bond with their gods. It is morning in the home of Dondu, a peasant. He has wakened his god with an offering to keep him working at his side to bring blessing to his field and his crop, to his house, and his wife, Durga, the mother of his children and the keeper of his house. Durga is India, Dondu is India, and their home and children are India, immutable India, always the same, seven days a week, year in and year out. The oxen are Dondu's faithful companions at work, the oxen, the wooden plow, and his son, Pondu. Lucky Vital can go to school. He is the one member of the household who will know how to read soon. His mother never had that chance. Married at 13, she never has changed the routine of her work. Dondu never went to school. He followed his father to the field from the day he began to walk. Durga followed her mother in the household chores as soon as she could walk. This is the land that Dondu's ancestors worked as tenants, and now Dondu owns it. Five acres in all, five acres to feed a family. Come on, good oxen, pull the plow and dig in deep to bring out the seeds of Dondu's sweat, as you've done for thousands of years, without rest for the man, without rest for the soil yielding fruit twice a year, twice a year or not at all, as pleases God. Come on, good oxen, turn the wheel and pull up the precious water. 
water that carries life across the field. Water mixed with sweat to moisten the furrows that will bear the wheat. And wheat means food for Dondu, food and income. It takes a third of a good harvest to feed the family, another third to pay the taxes, the rest to pay the debts, and usually nothing remains to provide for tomorrow. All this Dondu thinks as he follows the oxen along the familiar furrows of his field. From the distance, he hears the squeaking of the water wheel, and he listens to the reassuring murmuring as it trickles down the irrigation ditches toward his fields. For in one way, Dondu's village is lucky. It has good water wells and irrigation ditches, while hundreds of villages have none. Agricultural stations offer some help and hope. They teach the villagers how to use better tools and seeds. But most peasants have no money to buy seeds or tools. No money, and often not even hope. Like these neighbors of Dondu's, their land is small, their fields are shallow and scattered. Their family is large. They cannot even afford oxen to pull the plow. So they work the land with hands. Come on, good oxen, make the furrow deep. We need the grain for food for all of us, for taxes, lots of grain for taxes, and grain to pay the storekeepers, and grain for the offerings, and grain... Plot on, good oxen, plot on good people, in field and house. Here, Durga, Dondu's wife, cleans and plasters the hearth with clay and cow dung. If there were more women in her household, Durga would remain in the kitchen and would not leave there until the food has been served to the men. Other women of the household would clean the yard, carry the water, and do the washing. But Durga is alone. Therefore, she must go to the village well herself and do the washing in the village square. On the way, she meets other women, always busy performing their never-ending household chores. The village well is an important place for women. It is here that they hear about the coming and going of villagers, the births and deaths among neighbors, about weddings and separations. And while words are exchanged, hands do the work. For in India, many hands are needed to do the work. Many hands, each doing a chore. Many hands of the village to keep the village going. It is meal time. The food is almost ready. But on plowing day, Dondu and Pondu won't come home to eat. She'll take the food to the field. The meal is the only rest for the men since daybreak, their first escape from the scorching sun. Soon, Dorga leaves her men with their work and returns to the village a village where neighbors work and share, and live and work. The weaver of the cast of weavers, and the brickmaker of the cast of brickmakers cutting and drying the clay, and the street sweeper, an untouchable without cast, and the water carrier filling his goatskin with water, another untouchable without cast. Untouchables live on the outskirts of the village in mud huts. It is there that Pondu, Dondu's son, is going now to buy leather from the tanner, who is also an untouchable, because he handles the skins of dead animals. Only yesterday, all untouchables were considered unclean. Now they are supposed to be equal to other Hindus. That is the new law. But traditions are hard to break. Pandu, of the caste of peasants, and the tanner, belonging to no caste at all, are in an age of changes, changes that are still in the making. But regardless of equality prescribed by law, each caste goes on providing employment and shelter only for its own, while all castes together form the Hindu society of the village, working side by side, accepting life which never changes. That is Hinduism. 
The village butcher, Ali, is a Muslim, and Muslims have no caste distinctions. He and his fellow believers live in the same villages with Hindus, sometimes tolerated, other times fanatically pursued, because they kill cows and eat their meat, meat of cows that are sacred to the Hindu. Ali and his Muslim neighbors could leave India and move to Pakistan in the Muslim north. They would not be persecuted in Pakistan. But these people do not go, for there is no more land nor easier living in Pakistan. Dondu's plow has broken down. He needs help from the village blacksmith. The blade needs sharpening. The blacksmith is an important man. He gets his share of the crop for his services, and his services are only available to the people of the village. The blacksmith, the son of a blacksmith, and the father of a blacksmith. Durga has left the house to go shopping, to look around, weighing in her mind the honors and rupees of her meager budget. How much can she spare? Almost everything Durga and her neighbors need, they make themselves. But there are some goods that have to be purchased with money. There is salt to be purchased, salt that comes from faraway mines and spices from the islands of Indonesia, and needles from Jamshadpur, or maybe from America or England, and pots and pans made with Indian hands on imported machines, for India has not yet sufficiently developed her own industries. But most important for Durga and other housewives are the cotton goods, cotton goods spun by Indian hands on machines that come from across the world. This piece would make a fine sari. Who knows? Maybe Dondu's brother worked on it in the mill in the town nearby. Dondu's brother attends the spindles together with other men from nearby villages. They all are farmers and sons of farmers. Their hands still show calluses from handling the plow. Here are the dyers giving the cotton cloth the required coloring. They, too, come probably from within walking distance of the mill. But now they are workers in industry, some of them with union cards, many of them with confused allegiances, but all of them slowly becoming industrial workers in a complex society. They left the overcrowded villages and made more room for those who remained. Every factory in India is a small vent which relieves the heavy pressure on the land. And every mine absorbs manpower from the land, every coal pit, every quarry, wherever wealth is extracted from under the soil. And the soil of India is rich deep under its surface with coal, iron, mica, manganese, chromium, magnesite, oil. And as more mines are opened, more men will move away from the crowded fields. In the hot sun, the sons of peasants turn to mining and get their daily bread out of the soil of India. Meager bread, nevertheless bread for survival. Meager bread until the tools become better and more abundant in factories, in mines, and on the fields. The season of merciless dust and heat has come. Whether miner or farmer, man or animal, they all suffer. They suffer and fear. They fear and wait, and wait and watch. They watch the clouds and check the sky for the rains to come, to come in time to drench the soil and bless the seeds and give them bread. Will the rain come in time? Will the wells fill up again? Will the ditches flow with the precious water? From the city and from agricultural stations, men come to speak to the villagers. The village listens to the men from outside, but their thoughts are centered on the rain, on the rain and the harvest that it will bring if it comes in time, and the misery that it will leave in its wake if it comes too late. They all look to the east from where the clouds are beginning to stream inland from the moist sea. Welcome is the music of the thunder that carries the message of rain. And welcome is the flash of lightning that reveals the clouds in the distance. And welcome is the torrent that falls upon the thirsty land and people. 
Paint your anvil, blacksmith, and forge new plows. Stock your shops, merchants, with better things for all. The rain has come. Blow your tiny torch, artisan. Build your castle, silversmith. Hammer your silver, worker. Weave your silken threads, carpet maker. Loom your belt, weaver. Keep alive the patterns of India's ancient arts. The rain has come and brought us new hopes. Hopes of a better tomorrow, with more schools to drench the thirst for knowledge. With the liberation come true, richly watered, blessed with bounty, nestling in the cool shade of the wood, covered with the green of crops, my motherland. <laughs>